Yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Vitamin C's with me, your boy, Adam Taylor. As usual, I'm joined by my homie, my compadre, my co-host in crime, Mr. Tim Shields. What's popping, Tim? Nothing much, man. As you can see, I have a brand new setup. You can't see my desk, but you can tell that my camera angles change because I got a very fancy desk off Amazon. Cost me a little pretty, pretty amount of money, but I'm very happy and I'm excited to have some awesome news for us. All that money, man. Look at you shelling out big, ready for this announcement. So anyone mm -hmm. that follows this channel knows that we've been uh we've been away a hot minute, probably what, about two weeks. Like we come on, we're like, hey, we're gonna do some more when we went away. And the reason we disappeared for a hot minute was because we had some negotiations going on in the background. As of this episode, we're officially part of the CLNS Media Network. So, you know, the guys that bring you Celtics All Access, Celtics Post Game, Celtics Lab, Celtics Beat, Celtics Talk. Uh, we're, we're joining those guys. Uh, we think that that's a huge opportunity for us. It's going they're exceptionally good at what they do. So being able to join a bunch of people that have like way more knowledge of how to develop YouTube, develop a presence on here, that's going to be great for us. So as of today, we will officially be telling you every time we're on air, we are part of the CLNS Media Network, and we're hoping that with their help, we can take this to the moon. Yeah, and that's um, that's the exciting announcement. We've been working on this for a little bit. Um, and now the next move is we will also be having audio. Um, might take an episode or two, but we will have us officially up on Apple Podcast feeds. So it'll be on there. Um, and we will continue to offer this on our channel um, under Adam. And we will also have some of our segments up on CLNS Media and Celtics All Access. So be sure to follow those as well. And please just share the channel, guys. Once we get over this thousand hump, we are going to be able to monetize. And we're going to be, we're all in on this. So this is what we've got. We're happy to be able to do this together. Um, and this has been a long time coming. So it's really, really great to be able to do this with Adam. And uh, we thank you guys for subscribing. So. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of carry on from there, when we say we're all in, I'm actually walking away from all of my other Celtics podcasts to focus on this. So before I was doing like, you know, I was doing the Celtics blog podcast. I've been there for probably three years. That one was a gut punch to walk away from. Um, definitely had some, I had some great interviews there. You know, Gordon Haywood came through, Kendrick Perkins came through. A couple of ex-players have hit, been on there. You know, Semi Ojale was on there recently. So um, I've chose to walk away from that because this opportunity is like so big that I didn't want to be splitting my time and then rushing for episodes and not really giving it, giving either this or the podcast I was doing the love it, the, that it needed and the effort that it needed. And also, it just means that when I land guests or if Tim lands guests, you know, if I dive into that Rolodex and bring somebody on that they're all going to be fed through this show. So nobody's missing out. Nobody has to go and find two, three, four different feeds to see who I've been with, who I've interviewed or who we've interviewed. It's all just going to be central here. Um, so that for me to walk away from a three year commitment where I would built that feed up to something which can be considered like you know fairly successful for me to walk away from that to focus on this that just shows you how all in we are and it also shows you that that consistency is going to be there because i'm not doing the show that i've been consistent on for the past three years so hopefully um you know if you follow me on that show i'm sorry but we are going to be here multiple times a week three four times a week we'll be doing some live streams for pre-game and whatever we're going to have some fun with it man we're going to make this a little little hub Okay, so we've done like four minutes now of where we are. <laughs> we give the announcement. Everybody knows what they need to know at this point. So let's get into the topic of today. And the topic of, topic of today is Luke Cornet, the Green Cornet, or the Green Cornet, if you want to be more precise with the Marvel kind of you know trajectory. It's a Hornet, not a, <laughs> not a Hornet. Yeah, you know, so we sort of thought, we've been waiting for this, right? Like all off season, everybody's been sat telling us like. Um, Yo, Luke Cornett's that guy. He's going to kind of absorb those minutes from Rob Williams. He's going to be that primary backup big. I was against it. Then I went back and done a bunch of film work, wrote an article about it. I was kind of not as badly against it, but then he hurts his ankle. And clearly it was worse than what the team announced because he didn't participate in the first few games. We saw some Noah Vanley. I think the first game or two of Vanley was fine. But I think as the season started to go forwards, we started to see 
the defensive limitations of playing Van Lee start to come through. I don't think like um, he was atrocious. If you follow me on social media, on Twitter mainly, you would have saw that I put out a few clips of Van Lee just getting absolutely smoked on the perimeter. Um, it was really bad. So those limitations came up. And now Luke Cornett kind of, you know, Van Lee played seven minutes in the game on Friday. I'm trying to remember who that was against. Cavaliers. Yeah, yep, yeah, seven minutes against the Cavs, and then he got garbage minutes against the Wizards, right? So Luke Cornett kind of came in, shown that he was making a difference with his length and size and his screening ability against the Cavs, and then earned that rock, that full role against the Wizards. Sorry, there's just so many days and games, and I've been watching a bunch more NBA games this year. Um, so there's a lot going on with Luke Cornett at the moment. I think that. He's definitely showing some form of value that he might be able to keep things ticking over a little bit better than what Van Lee could until Rob Williams is back in that rotation. Yeah, and I am wondering, they they did go to it a little bit, um, specifically against the Cavaliers, but they went to that double big lineup. I think they had Griffin and Cornet out on the floor at the same time. I think everyone's stock in Griffin is really, really dropping. Like, I think he might be out of the rotation there. And I mean, if he's just going to be a vibes guy, that's great. But I think what we've seen out of Cornet the last two games, I mean, specifically that Cavs game, I think he was, I think he had about 25 minutes on the floor and no other center outside of Al Horford had more minutes than him. No other center on the roster cleared more than 11 or 12 minutes. I think it was Griffin. And then, like you said, Von Lee had like seven minutes in that game. So it, it, it looks like, awful, Cornet- dude. like it was really bad. They were just, they were dragging him out. Yeah. They were baiting him onto the perimeter and then just cooking him. Like well, it was, yeah, it was bad. He, he's not going to be that kind of defensive guy, right? Like I think when they brought in Von Lee, I think he's sort of that guy that gives you a bit of energy and his speciality is not going to be on the defensive end, but yeah, it looked rough. I mean, to be fair, the Cavaliers, came out and they punched the Celtics right in the teeth. That was a tough game. It was definitely winnable. The Celtics had a chance there at the end and they should have closed it out. I digress. I just think um, the Cavaliers need to be taken very, very seriously this season. Um, in, in terms of what we saw from Cornette, though, I thought I thought he looked really poised. And considering that, you know, he missed all of that time in the preseason and in, you know, training camp and all that with that ankle injury that keeps coming up. He looked pretty damn good in this last game against the Wizards. You know, he had 19 minutes, I think. He was a plus 11. He's not doing anything that's like fantastic in terms of like, I don't know, like he's not like lighting it up offensively, but he's doing all the things that you need him to do. He's keeping your defense afloat there. And I don't know if you noticed this, but I feel like against the Wizards specifically, there was a lot more switching. It felt like there yeah, was a was bit a more any, switching. Any drop, dude. It was an aggressive mm. switch. And I think that's just because Cornet can kind of switch onto bigs and then get scrammed out if, they, if he gets a mismatch. Someone smaller than him's on him. He's a bit more mobile. I wouldn't say that he's ridiculously mobile. His hips are still a little bit stiff. He doesn't flip them perfectly. Um, he got caught a few times uh, with a three-second violation, which is multiple violations in one game in the NBA is usually quite rare. Guys usually can just camp there and nobody's <laughs> calling that. So that was fun. I mean, offensively, defensively, he's going to give you a bit better a bit better rim protection than what Van Lee does just because of that length. You see him doing that where he's not jumping out to contest shots. He's just jumping up vertically. And people think that's funny, but it definitely, like... It works. If you remember during the NBA bubble, one of the biggest things that a lot of players were saying when they were struggling for shooting was like, hey, we don't have any like lines of sight, any points of reference. We've never played in this gym before. And it's messing with our ability to kind of gauge distance, gauge arc. Well, you think when Cornet jumps that high, he's seven foot already. So he's probably covering about 12 feet once he's jumping. And now all of a sudden a player's trajectory, shot trajectory has to change because they can't see where their rim is and they're thinking they have to shoot over that 12 feet. So it does alter trajectories. I can see why it would be beneficial. If you imagine being down at like an LA fitness and taking a jumper and a guy just jumps and covers the rim. You're like, dude, where's the rim? I just got to let it fly and hope that my muscle memory helps me. It does make a difference. Offensively. I think, um, I think he was really good as a screener. I put this out on Twitter earlier today as screen assist points, like put players that scored points directly off a of loop corner assist a uh, screen. Sorry. Corner had 12 screen assist points. Damn. The wizards had 16 as a team. Do you know what I'm saying? Like he, he was a good screener, a willing screener, uh, whether that was staggers, whether it was singles, pins, um, pin ins, whatever he was, whatever type of screen he was throwing out there. He was very poised. He didn't really move. He set his feet. 
made sure there was contact before moving on. And then I think, and then the only downside is I would have liked him. There was a few times where he had got the ball in that midi and he could have just let a floater go. And it, he kind of like redirected the rock and gave the defense time to reset. That will come in time, right? That aggression, that scoring aggression will come in time. I do like the fact that he hit that corner free. And the reason I like the fact he hit this corner free is this. If you watch the Cavs play, they do a lot of screening actions where it's like a stagger screen. And they'll have Evan Mobley come off, like be one of the screen setters and then pop into the corner. And then Mobley just occupies that corner shooter role. And the reason they do that is because whoever, whatever big is guarding Mobley, you've basically taken him out of the defensive possession. Now, you're not going to help off of Evan Mobley because he's going to hit the free. And you, or he's going to drive at you. And with his size and the way he can kind of drop step round guys, he might get a, he might get a poster on you. So you're gonna you're gonna keep a big on him, and if he's in the corner, that spaces out the low man help around the defense at the like around the rim, and now there's more room for guys like Donovan Mitchell to drive and do what they need to do. If Cornet can keep hitting freeze, and it's far too early yet for him to have that type of gravity, but if he's like say I don't know, say he's taking free freeze a game, and he's averaging. 38% on them by January. While now running stagger actions and having him pop to the corner could have some semblance of impact of what we see with Mobley, obviously on a lesser scale, but it's just that extra wrinkle that I think is going to be important. I don't really want him shooting threes from above the perimeter, but if that's going to help with delay actions, you know, where the big man's got the ball at the top, then fine, I'm cool with it. But overall, I think he's been solid, like really solid. And it's interesting that you mentioned like Mobley as a, as a comparison there for that corner three spot, because I'm pretty sure Mobley hit like a really big three um, in that later in the game in the Celtics game, because I remember like a rebound trickled out. Al Horford was like, who didn't box out? And then he had to go make a late contest and Mobley just drained it from the three. Um, those those bigs in Cleveland are scary, but I, I think what we saw from Cornette was really promising. I'm interested to see if they can get him more comfortable offensively because they're right now, like I think there is a very big drop off between what you're getting from guys like Grant Williams, what you're getting from Al Horford to a degree. And Al's been taking a lot of threes this year. I don't know if you've noticed this, but like Al Horford specifically has been taking like a heavy amount of threes. Most of his shot profile feels like it's coming from three point range. Yeah. And it's because he had such a hot end to the season last year in the playoffs. You know, he was mm -hmm. draining threes there consistently. Teams also kind of sag off him a little bit because he does a lot of handoff creation on the perimeter. So it's kind of, do we want to sag off and protect the drive if it's Jalen Brown coming off a handoff or Jason Tatum coming off a handoff? Or do we want to push up on Horford and kind of contest the three that might or might not be there? So what teams are doing is they're sagging off by about a foot, a foot and a half. And then if Horford goes into the shooting motion, you're close enough to be able to close back out quickly and impact the shot. But you, but also you're deep enough to be able to deal with drive. The thing is, I think Horford, if you look, his release just seems a little bit quicker than it used to be. Um, I, I think his mechanics are just he's going through those motions a little bit faster than what he used to. So that's allowing him to get the shot off a bit earlier. And if you look at the Celtics, a lot of their releases seem to have been just that little bit faster. And they're making so many extra passes to find guys wide open that even if you've got a bit of a slower release and Horford's always had a slower release. It doesn't matter, right? Because just so much space between you and everybody. We saw it in um, we saw it against the, the Wizards. They were just driving, kicking, waiting for the defense to close out, and then swinging again, ready for that open shot. And uh, it's that type of basketball that's going to keep getting Horford good looks. And I don't blame him for shooting more outside as well, because he wants to. If you're shooting from deep, you're avoiding all the contact that comes with going down onto the post. You know what I'm saying? And you want to keep Horford as injury free, as contact free as possible this early in the year, because you're going to need him to play physical later once the playoffs come. Yeah, and I think overall his minutes workload has been pretty high. Um, they did a good job in this Wizards game of getting him out pretty early. Um, I think he only played, by looks of it, yeah, he only played 24 minutes against the Wizards. I um, mean, what was a really comfortable win for the Celtics? But I think this, again, this comes back to Cornette's role with this team. Uh, in terms of like true blue centers on this roster, it's going to be Cornette. Like Von Lake can play some five. He's definitely bulked up to be that. But like we talked about before, his defense isn't what you need it to be. And I think Cornette's ability to guard the pick and roll to a certain extent um, is really good. 
And so that makes it a lot easier for you to sub him in there at that center spot. Now, I still, we've talked about it a little bit before, but I think they still need to try and add something just because I don't think you're getting enough out of Blake Griffin to justify giving him minutes. Um, Grant Williams is in there. You're going to see him usually at the four, unless they really, really, really want to go small. And then you can see him at the five. But I think ultimately, like the best version of this team right now, based on what they've got in house, um, you want to see Jason Tatum at the three, which means you need to add someone who can play a little bit of the four, a little bit of the five. Maybe it's not a true blue center, maybe a trade for a guy. Um, we'll definitely cover that on a later pod. But I, I think oh, maybe the what there's been a bunch of big man trade articles come out. We're definitely going through that in the next day or two. Oh, I mean, yeah, there's been, I've seen a ton of different trade, um, from Jakob Pertl to Mo Bamba to Jay Nerland Noel. Yo, give, give me Jalen Smith, bro. Have you seen it? He's been playing well for the for the Pacers to start. I wish the they got him last time, man. Yo, I'm we saying, dude. That that's what I'm saying. We'll get into it. It's gonna be so much fun. I love trade talk. TPE's I mean, the one baby. thing I will say, <laughs> you said that um Vanley isn't really a five. You can't really play him at the four either because he can't defend on the perimeter, right? Too slow, right? Yeah, he doesn't have that that the three point shooting, so he's not really gonna space the floor for you. So your spacing starts to get a little bit janky. Yeah, dude. I'm, I, I mean, I, was, I wasn't tweener? high on him. Would you yeah, say he's a tweener? Kind of, well, I, was de- I was just seeing him as a fourth or fifth big in a rotation at this point. I wasn't high on him when they originally brought him into training camp. Mm. I, went, I went back and watched his games in China. I wasn't high on his performances in China. And if you don't stand out in China, you're definitely not going to stand out in the NBA. And then, you know, I thought the first two games, I, I even put a tweet out there saying maybe I was wrong. You know, everybody has bad takes. Maybe this is one of mine. I feel a little bit more vindicated now. I'm not <laughs> saying it's terrible, but I think Luke Corner is a clear upgrade. I think the defense looked way better. The offense flowed better. I, I'm down. Roll with Luke Cornett till Rob's back and then slide Luke into that third big, like third backup center option. Yeah. And I think that's fine. I think part of it also comes with comfort, right? Like I think cornet has been here enough. The team showed some faith in him, giving him this contract that they did. Um, so it, it's a matter of him just being a little bit more acclimated. I, I'm hoping that Vonley gets more comfortable, right? Like that's, it's a good thing to have guys who are comfortable in the system and where it's like, Oh, I, I have to decide like every single night who I'm going to give minutes to. But I think right now you're starting to see like this rotation sort of pan out. I mean, when Rob comes back, you're going to see some changes here. That's a given. Like your your starting lineup is going to change. You're going to see either Derek come out or maybe Al Horford comes off the bench if you're trying to have Tatum at the four and you're trying to like limit Al's workflow. Um, there can be a lot of different changes you can make with that. But I think one thing specifically with Vonley that I want to see is just just trying to get a little bit faster with the defensive reads because I think it if. He doesn't have the speed. He needs to be able to read the situation faster to put himself in a better spot. Um, and one last thing, I honestly think that the reason why they went out and got Vonley was because of the fact that they didn't land Montrell Harrell. And we obviously saw the comments from Harrell saying that they offered him a role. He wasn't down with it. That was before Rob ended up being out eight to 12 weeks. So who knows if things would have gone differently there. But I think he's just an energy guy. And that's kind of what you got from him. Yeah, and like there was other bigs available though, right? Like he chose to bring in Blake. I'm completely fine with that as a vibes dude, as just a a bit of an enforcer if you need someone to like come off the bench and just bang into people for a while. I'm down. Like I've said before, this guy, when you're talking about Blake, you got to remember this is a dude that punched out his own trainer. Like if you need an enforcer on the bench, you need an enforcer on the bench. I'm down. But you chose to bring in Vanley when there was like a Dwight Howard, there was a Demarcus Cousins, there was a Hassan Whiteside. There was other options there that probably could have gave you a little bit more on the glass. Maybe not as much in terms of just mobility and possibly defense. I don't know. But there was definitely guys there that could have gave you something. So choosing Vanley, they must have seen something in training camp that made them feel like he was the best choice out of what was available. But again, I'm not sure I was down. Same as Justin Jackson. Like, I would have preferred that to have gone to Carmelo Anthony. You know, it is what it is at this point. And I'm not saying they're bad players. I'm just like, hey, having Melo come on when, you, when you're struggling for buckets and everything kind of slows down and get an extra couple of points, fine. But we are where we are. We're here. Uh, I think that the team's good. I think that Cornet really did help galvanize that defense last night. So I'm down for him to get those minutes until Rob was back. And then obviously you change up your rotations. Amen okay. To that. 
<laughs> yeah, amen. Right, everybody, if you've enjoyed it, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you send us some tweets. We want to do these nice things. Send us nice things back. We'll be with you again later this week when we're going to look at these trade talks because I've seen a few articles. So I want to pull for it. Tim, I'll text you all the trades over, the articles, and then uh, mm. tomorrow or Wednesday, we'll come back and we'll hit them too. Hell yeah. <laughs>